Welcome everyone. Thanks for being here. We'll go ahead and get started in a couple minutes. Looking at the participant list and there's a Wayland in the room, and that's my fun name. That's a very unique name. Nice to meet you, Wayland. Same spelling and everything. So, Kathy, I'm going to go ahead and promote you to a panelist. And then... There you go. And then Kathy, I'm going to make you co-host so that you can unmute yourself. Hi, Kathy. Do you want to do a um, sound check? Sure. I you, Can you hear me? Sound great. Perfect. Great. And then um, are you familiar with advancing your own slides if we give you um, access to do that in Zoom or do you want one of us to advance them for you? Um, I can probably advance them just by pushing the arrows. Is that correct? Exactly. Yep. Okay, perfect. Got it. And if anything happens, we'll be here to help you out. I think I just have the first two. Is Daisy, are you gonna move those for me? Um, or how do I, I do can? It? Okay. <laughs> And yes, this recording will be shared on the RP Group's Multiple Measures Assessment Project website, and I'll put the link in the chat for those who want to access it. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. We're right at noon and we have a packed schedule. Thanks to everyone for being here today. I am Mallory Newell. I am with the RP Group in the Multiple Measures Assessment Project. And we are so excited to um, be presenting some data on um, throughput rates for our disabled student populations. I am joined here by uh, my co-MAP um, team member, Daisy Segovia, and then some of our um, chancellor's office uh, staff members that support disabled students and um, three colleges were joined by Citrus College, San Diego City College and De Anza College who are gonna be sharing um, some of their promising practices. This webinar will is being recorded in the slides and webinar will be posted and I'll put that in the chat. We are encouraging you to use the um, Q&A function if you do have questions for any of the panelists. Um, we're going to try to get through a lot of information, so we'll be answering questions through um, Q&A rather than live. All right, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Daisy. Uh, thank you, everyone, and for joining us today. I'm really excited to share some some results from of some analysis that we've been doing, looking at AB705 and our disabled students, um, and also having some panelists here who are going to be discussing what support they have been giving their DSPS students at their colleges. And hopefully we can have a really great discussion about um, AB705 and how we can get students through their transfer level English and math. Um, so first I'm going to uh, hand it over to Mila Kili here, who is here from the Chancellor's Office. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Mia Keeley with the Chancellor's Office. I'm a Dean in Educational Services and Support, and DSPS is one of the programs underneath me. Also on the slide, you have contact information for Thalia Marroquin, our DSPS lead at the Chancellor's Office. I really just wanted to share my excitement and support for today's webinar. I think these results will show that the supports we have for our DSPS students are working and that we're really thankful for the impact equitable placement has had on our students. And they really show that when students have access, they can succeed in our transfer level courses. So if you move to the next slide, please. 
we just have some additional resources here where you can find more information on our DSPS program. We will welcome um, any other questions at the end of the presentation, and we're just really happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mia. So let's get started and talk about some of this data that we've been looking at, um, and specifically on the throughput in transfer level English and math for students with disabilities. Um, and so what we did here is we were really trying to investigate um, whether AB705 is working for different groups of students. So our previous reports, if you're familiar with those, have shown that students overall have really benefited from its implementation. For example, uh, the transfer level math and English completion has more than doubled. And then students belonging to special populations such as foster youth veterans, um, et, et cetera, have been positively impacted by this policy so far. And so the question remains is, does this also work for students with disabilities? Um, and so what we did here is we used the uh, throughput rates to examine students in transfer level English and math and the completion within one year. So just as a reminder, throughput is kind of calculated by getting when the student starts in the either math or English and following them through a year to see if they, if they complete a transfer level course. So in this presentation, we'll show the rates by academic years for students who began the sequence in either subject within that year. Um, and we'll compare data from before AB705 was implemented. So that would be the 2015-16 year and after its first full year of implementation in 1920. Um, so how we kind of put students in the different categories will depend on whether they got any services from disabled students programs and services. So we'll compare the rates for students with no disabilities, meaning that they did not get services from DSPS, then students with disabilities they did get services from DSPS. And then we'll disaggregate that even further by looking at their primary disability to see if the rates differ from this. And then it will do additional disaggregation of, of comparing uh, female students and male students uh, within each of these groups. Um, so the way that we defined these primary disability categories was using the uh, Chancellor's Office Management Information System, which also uses Title V definitions. And so we'll have these different categories that we'll talk about, um, acquired brain injury, ADHD, autism, blindness, uh, deaf and hard of hearing, intellectual disability, learning disability, mental health disability, physical disability, and then all other disabilities. Um, and just to note that speech and language impaired is not included because of the data collection stopped in, for that group in 2017-18. And so the first thing that I kind of want to show is who are these students who are enrolling in these transfer level math and English courses. And so when we look at the enrollment of those who actually begin taking English courses at any level, we see that for those students who do not have any disability, the non-DSPS co cohort size here, we see a 12% increase in enrollment in these courses um, from 1617 up to 1920. And so within these five years, the enrollment in English courses at any level level are increasing. But when we look at our students with disabilities, we see that there is a kind of significant drop in enrollment in these courses. So between these five years from 15, 16 to 19 and 20, it, they dropped in about 24% for English um, with, with these cohorts that we looked at. Um, when we look at how this breaks out for each of these disability uh, categories, we see that overall the trend is a uh, uh, see because it's across all of these groups where there is kind of an a decrease in enrollment in English courses for most of these groups. And so the only exception would be the students with ADHD. There was a slight increase in those uh, students as well as students with autism. There is a little bit of increase in that, but overall we're seeing across the different disability types that there, there is a decrease in enrollment within English. And then when we look at the uh, enrollment in the math courses, again, this is uh, enrollment in any level, we're seeing that the non-DSPS group is uh, showing a slight decrease of 8% here. So fewer students are seem to be enrolling in math courses overall. Uh, but the DSPS students, uh, we're seeing an even in greater increase of, of about negative 26% um, in enrollment in math. Uh, 
And then again, when we break this out by the different disability categories, we're seeing overall, again, most students are also not enrolling as great numbers in mathematics, with again, the exception of ADHD and autism students. So kind of the primary uh, question that we've had is, is are these students getting through these transfer English math courses once they kind of start the sequence? So comparing the throughput rates for students with disabilities, without disabilities, and by disability types, we see that generally there is an increase in throughput rates um, over these five years. So what we're seeing here is those increases in the slopes of those different lines are going up, meaning that from 1516 to, uh, to 2019, we're seeing an increase on in the students who are actually completing transfer level mathing courses within one year. When we look at the um, transfer level, the non-DSP students here, uh, we're seeing that they went from 49 to 68% of them are completing in English. And for the students with DSPS, again, we're seeing a significant increase from going from 37 to 63 of the students completing transfer level English and math within one year. So overall, even though they're not quite catching up to the, the students without disabilities, they are showing increased gains. And then when we look across the different groups, what we're seeing is some of the students with different types of disabilities are actually outperforming those without disabilities. And so you'll see the 68 kind of percent. So if you look across these different groups, we'll see that some students with different types of disabilities are exceeding the performance. And so you'll see that here with the students with acquired brain injury, you see that with students with ADHD, you see that with students with blindness, and you see it with students with physical disabilities. Now, in math, we also are seeing an increase in throughput rates across all groups, um, which is a good thing to see. So with students without disabilities, oops, sorry, it went too far. Um, you'll see that it went from 27 to 51. So not as, as, as great as an increase as those in English, but still seeing improvement in those throughput rates. Now, when we look at the students with um, disabilities here, we're seeing them go again from 16 to 38. So that is a significant increase, but we're not quite catching the performance of students without disabilities. And again, when we look across um, all the disability groups, we're seeing that some performance for different groups are varied across these groups, but we're not quite catching the performance of the students without disability case. In math, um, none of the students with disabilities ca caught up to the ones without disabilities. However, when we look to see how much they've gained um, within these five-year time frame, we're seeing that they are significantly improving um, in these throughput rates. And so for students without disabilities, they gained about 19 percentage points in English and about 24 percentage points um, in math. When you look at the students with disabilities overall, you're seeing that they're actually gaining more in English. So they, they saw a 26 percent point increase there. And in math, although they did not quite catch up to the ones the students without disabilities, we're seeing that they are getting very similar gains um, overall in math throughput rates. Now, again, when we look at the different disability groups here, we're seeing that some students are seeing more gains than others, um, specifically those with acquired brain injuries saw a huge jump from 30% points in English and 32% points in math. And then also some other groups are showing significant gains. Um, and students who are deaf and hard of hearing also getting about 29% points um, in both English and math there. Uh, students uh, with learning disabilities saw a huge jump in English throughput rates, about 28% points there, but not as quite as high as in, in math, only about 28%. So overall, we're seeing that there are differences um, between uh, the different disability groups of so some getting more than others, but what we're good thing here is that everyone is gaining and no one is doing worse than before AB705 has been implemented. Um, so kind of the next question uh, we kind of want to talk about is to kind of dig further to see if we can kind of dive into who's who's gaining more, who's not gaining more, to see where can we can maybe focus, uh, who we can help. And so we did some further disaggregation by gender to kind of allow for this more thorough investigation. 
So what first you'll be seeing here is this is just English throughput rates here. And you'll see that the uh, uh, female students rates are in that lighter orange and then the male rates are in a darker orange. And so what we're seeing with English is that there are uh, gender differences here where the female students tend to be a slight little bit higher than male students in their throughput rate performance. And this seems to be true for all groups uh, across this chart. Um, and so for the students without disabilities, the female students went from 51 to 71, and male students went from 47 to 65. Um, and then when we look at the performance of the DSPS group overall, we're seeing kind of more parallel um, performance here where the female students are kind of on par with the non-DSPS female students. Um, that, that the male students, again, fall a tiny bit lower, but essentially performing about the same as non-DSPS students. Now, when we look across the different disability types, this is when you're starting to see a little bit more of the difference between uh, female students and male students' performance. Uh, for example, here uh, with the students with acquired brain injury, the female students jumped up to a 90% uh, throughput rate uh, completion of their transfer level English, whilst the male students only kind of saw a moderately increase of 66%. And when you look across these different groups, you'll see that um, the, again, female students, uh, apologies for that, female students higher here for ADHD, higher for blindness, and higher for those, for those students with the physical disabilities. Um, and male students, again, falling lower, but still seeing uh, vast increases um, throughout. And so when we look at those specific increases, is when you can really see where those differences are kind of coming up. Again, when we look at the students with acquired brain injury here, the female students jumped a whopping 51% points um, in their throughput rate, while the, while the male students only about 18%. And again, you'll see that kind of across these different groups, female students in, with blindness, uh, female students with intellectual disabilities, female students with physical disabilities are kind of seeing more of those gains and English throughput rates. But in some of the groups, we're seeing the opposite kind of trend. For example, the students with ADHD, the male students kind of gained a little bit more in the throughput rates um, there. And then those with autism, again, we're seeing the, the male students um, having a little bit more gains on the throughput rates for them. So when we look at this uh, for math, what you're seeing here is a little bit more of an overlap uh, among these lines. And so what you're seeing with the lines kind of almost being on top of each other. So it kind of shows that in math, there's not as, as much of a gender difference in the performances. Um, for the students without disabilities here, you'll see that again, the, the lines are kind of basically overlapping. And when you look at the students with disabilities in the beginning in 2015-16, they're essentially performing the same, but you're starting to see uh, some of those um, gender differences start emerging in 2019-20, where there's a little bit more of a, a difference between the gender groups here. Um, again, with students with uh, acquired brain injury at the beginning in 2015-16, basically almost overlapping, but then you're starting to see uh, more of a difference between the gender groups here, uh, where this female students had the throughput rate of 53, but male students only gaining it about the 38. Um, when we take a look at those specific um, uh, differences here, again, we'll see where these gender differences are kind of popping out. And so overall, the non-DSPS students, uh, female students gaining about 27% points in math throughput rate, uh, male students gaining about 22. And we see, um, again, acquired brain injury, the, the female students having more of those gains in math throughput rates, as well as blindness, uh, mental uh, disabilities here kind of popping up for the first time and then the physical ones again. And where we see the trend to be in the opposite case, we see that for deaf and hard of hearing students where male students um, were gaining more in math throughput rates than, um, than the female students in these groups. So what kind of does this mean? 
Um, so I think the good news is that there is uh, evidence to support that AB 705 has resulted in improved outcomes for students for disabilities across these groups. And the benefits were kind of more substantial for some disability types over others. So for example, we saw both in English and in math that this with acquired brain injury, blindness, deaf or hard of hearing, and physical disabilities kind of are performed even those with students without disabilities. And those with um, intellectual and learning disabilities kind of experience those lower rates. Uh, when we kind of dove further into the data to see if they were any gender differences, we saw that they were more apparent in the English super rates um, than in the math, but those, those rates are starting to emerge in math kind of in the later years. Um, when we kind of dove into these gender differences, that also kind of allowed us to see that these uh, percent point changes were probably driven by the performance of female students over um, the other gender groups. And also, I just want to make a note that um, uh, we only recently started collecting data for non-binary students, and because those groups are still kind of small, we didn't include them in these analyses, but as we start collecting that data more and further down the line, we, we will definitely be including that group as well. Um, for comparison um, and, and additional uh, reports. Um, so we can kind of conclude from this uh, is that, that students with disabilities are succeeding under AB 705, just like um, everyone else. Um, and they should be kind of placed similarly to non-DSPS students with appropriate and uh, support and accommodations, of course. Um, and the, the segregation of this data kind of allowed us to see where some of these decisions can be guided about where to focus the resources and support, which students might need it um, um, more than others or different type of support than one um, might need more than others as well. And you, you know, definitely should talk to the people at your DSPS offices to kind of talk, discuss through what kind of supports they may need, because they're going to be the experts that have been uh, working with these students and might know, for example, why a fem female student with acquired brain injury might need different kind of resources or accommodations with male students um, with a brain coin injury. And so those kind of discussions will really lead to um, then, you know, uh, creating support um, and accommodation that will further help students get through these transfer level math and English courses. Um, and so what we have next is going to be um, some sharing from different colleges who will be discussing what kind of support they've been giving their DSPS students so far in the wake of AB 705 to get them through these transfer level courses. Um, and so for our first college, we Daisy, have- I'll just interrupt you yeah. just for one second. Um, I just wanted to pause on the conclusion and then just turn it over to um, Dean Keeley, see if there's anything that she wanted to add from the Chancellor's Office perspective and then encourage participants to use the Q&A for any questions. We'll be sure to answer them there. I think one thing that we would like to add is we have seen these historical improvements in outcomes, but we still need to continue to ensure that we're granting access to these courses for our students with disabilities. I think that we're still seeing lower numbers of students with disabilities in these transfer level courses. And now that the data has been showing that they succeed like everyone else, I think it's really important that we increase access and ensure these students are being placed into those um, those courses appropriately. So the historically small size of the populations in transfer level courses and the decline in transfer level enrollment for these students, that's what we want to see now um, increase. So I think that's really an important point. Yeah, and I'll note that I did look at enrollment just generally for students with disabilities across the state, and it seems that they are also declining generally in enrolling in the community colleges. So it's not just that they are not um, enrolling in these transfer level English courses and math courses. So again, like this is something that we definitely need to be seen to be increases that they're enrolling in college, the colleges and as well enrolling in these transfer level English and math courses. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Daisy. You can move us on to our first college that will be sharing their promising practices, and we'll start it off with um, Orange Coast. 
Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I do want to apologize if there is some glitchiness on my end. Uh, sometimes technology doesn't work that well on my end, but uh, my name is Amra Pepik Kubati, and I am an instructional associate at the, the SPS office at Orange Coast College. Um, I specifically teach learning support classes. Can you please go to the next slide, Daisy? And so um, I really wanted to talk a little bit about educational assistance classes, what they are, and, and truly wanted to just share out what has been students' feedback, specifically in classes that uh, have supported who have taken transferable English courses. Um, next slide, please, Daisy. And so who qualifies for the educational assistance class, specifically the learning support or learning A001 class at Orange Coast College? It is students with disabilities who are concurrently taking a transferable math and or English class. Now, I do wanna pause here for a moment because there are semesters where we, such as some of my colleagues, including myself, would also work with students who, strongly and firmly believe that they are not ready for AB 7 of classes, which is the transferable courses. And they seek that preparedness for that semester just so they can fully feel comfortable in a transferable English and or math uh, course. Next slide, please, Daisy. And so a lot of verbiage that I have used here is the verbiage that's shared by multiple DSPS offices amongst 116 community colleges within the CCC system. And many of you can see these key terms, right? We have this equal access, and then we're talking about uh, equal educational environment, student-centered practices, uh, academic support, attainable goals, and so on. But what does this really mean for a student with disability who is taking a transferable math and English course? So an educa educational assistance class, by all means, is not a mandated class that a DSPS office has to provide. But we are doing so as educators who are in this field and who want to see these students succeed. We are seeing that the data is showing that they are succeeding, but a lot of these students are showing those improvements because there is a support that's already in place. So with an educational assistance class, we are truly offering this equal access and opportunity to participate in a class that's fully student-centered. And if we're providing academic and mentorship support to provide these group of students so they can be successful in these classes, what does that really mean? Because a lot of conversation that happens with educational assistance classes is, well, hold on a second. How much of content do we actually present in an educational assistance class? And how does that content differ from the content that's presented in the actual AB 705 class, either math or English? But I really have to pause here for a moment. And the reason so is because we are working with individual differences. We are working with students who have education limitations that is pertainable to that particular student. And we're working with students when they're, it's not about pace, it's not about competition, it's about reaching those cognitive strategies and specific strategies that are necessary for this particular group of students to be successful in a transferable English and math course. And so mind you, most of the information that I will share today is information that mainly comes from my experiences uh, and from my students' feedback. I heavily, heavily, heavily rely on students' feedback. And so with an educational assistance class, we're actually preparing students with disabilities to assert those education limitations, own them from the cultural wealth approach, not the deficit approach, and say to themselves, voice that, that, that same voice and say, yes, I can definitely be successful in the class. And if I have to be successful in a transferable English course, what does that entail? If there is an educational assistance class that can support me throughout that journey, how can it support me? But these educational assistance classes heavily, heavily, heavily involve building foundational skills that are necessary for these students to be successful in these classes. And so lastly, they encourage our students to do what? To foster independence and attain educational learning opportunities. And I have to pause again here, and I wanna tell you why. Each semester, I have a cohort of students from 20 to 30. 
And during that first week, even though I have the disability verification in front of me, and I've had multiple conversations with the SPS counselors, LD specialists, I want to hear what that student has to tell me about his, her, or their experience throughout primary and secondary education. And mind you, I'll have five students who come from five different high school districts. Everybody has been given a different experience throughout these uh, classes. What does that entail and what does that mean? It means that one of them might have written a topic sentence. One of them might have never worked on a research paper. One of them might have never heard what a misplaced modifier is in writing and so on. And so now with this interactive process and these conversations, these constructive conversations with each student, focusing on that educational limitation of stability per student, we work on areas that are necessary for this student to be successful in a transferable English and math course. Please, there's the next slide. And I share this now with you with so much pride because this derives directly from my students. Every semester I present course evaluations to my students. And I think as educators, we are lifelong learners ourselves. And so I want them to tell me what has your experience been like in an educational assistance class and how has it benefited you with the actual AB705 class, which in this case, the transferable freshman composition class. So there was a myriad of those that I have received throughout semesters, but I have chosen a couple of them and I would like to share them out loud with you because they speak volume. The first one says, being able to have the learning support as a resource has definitely increased my want to become better as a student and develop more goals as I go. Having the support has made my learning process easier. Remember, it goes back to the individual disability, individual need. The patience and care for students is nothing I have ever experienced before. I appreciated how instructors, and by the way, this individual is, is referring to both English and math instructors within the DSPS office at OCC, looked at everyone the same, no matter where they were in their learning process. The aspects that have altered to reflect what I was learning in my freshman composition class, having the opportunity to work on strategies we struggle with, while knowing we can access the learning support boosts our ability to really understand what we are learning. Mind you, this example right here, it really stood out to me. He, this individual, he spoke as we, he was considering himself and other students with disabilities who were given this opportunity and this support via the SPS office at OCC. Next one said being able to fully focus on building one skill at a time helped me discover trouble areas and address them as needed. This course gave me more confidence as a writer. The most useful aspect that I felt I could take from this class and use in my freshman composition course was paragraph structure. So this one is really talking about content related information. Since English is not my first spoken language, I was never taught how to properly structure paragraphs. And so I share these with you because I hope that you can really see the illustration of student centeredness that's placed in educational assistance classes. These classes, as my colleague Daisy Segovia has mentioned, are there to support these students. They are taken as an accommodation class. And with it, as you can see, students are certainly showing the outcomes that are needed for them to be successful in a transferable math and or English class. Thank you. Thank you, Amra. Yes, as you know, as the data that I showed, we saw, we're seeing that the performances are just different across the students with different disabilities. And as you're you're kind of talking to right now, it's important to take that into account the students' different, you know, lived experiences and using those so they could help them get through these classes. So I love these quotes that you showed, and I love that that the support that you've been giving just to, to really individualize it um, so that they are able to get through these courses. Thank you. So up next, um, we have some colleagues here from um, San Diego City College, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Um, we're representing San Diego City College and our collaboration between our English and DSPS um, courses or DSPS departments to offer two courses available for students. Um, 
Whoops. D Daisy, can you um, go back, please? I might have you uh, control the screen. There we go. Uh, my name is Taylor Nichols. I'm a DSPS instructor and counselor, and I also coordinate our high tech center. And I'm joined by my colleague and co-teacher. And my name is Tucker Grimshaw. Um, I'm an English part-time instructor, and then I'm also an online accessibility mentor for San Diego Community College District, and also a doctoral student at USC. Um, and then just about our journey. So we, in a response to AB 705 and improving, um, increasing outcomes with for students with disabilities, we um, responded by creating these these co-requisite courses in a sense, these two partner courses, I should say. Mm -hmm. And it really aligns with our uh, City College Student Equity Plan, being able to um, increase transfer rates um, for our minoritized students, um, as well as attain their vision and goals and completion. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do this because um, both of our department chairs are highly encouraging and then also in, um, ex are excited about unsiloing ourselves from our different differing departments. And if you could just move this slide, Dave. Yeah. Thank you. So what we've done um, to kind of help promote these courses on the left hand side, you'll see a flyer that um, we distributed to um, our DSPS counselors, as well as the campus um, indicating, um, you know, the linkage of these courses. Mm -hmm. And then the, the two courses that are linked are English 101X, which is a co-requisite course, which was built uh, as a result of AB 705, reading and composition and um, academic literacy, and then also DSPS 43, which is advanced applied study skills. Um, and we co collaborated before the start of the semester through teams and were able to de develop this flyer, but also um, figure out ad codes and all of that good stuff um, so that we could get students involved and make sure that they're in the right place. And we wanted to be intentional with our curriculum design, and we purposely chose to offer this from a disability culture and disability studies perspective um, to be able to allow students to have an understanding or even an awareness of the disability experience, history, laws that may um, affect people with disabilities as well. Mm -hmm. And then we in, in include uh, universal design for learning, um, specifically thinking about the principles of universal UDL and thinking about flexibility. Um, and as an English instructor, I accept assignments in varying formats rather than just one. And then I, we also think about student need, going back to AMRA, like individual student needs and thinking about flexibility in that sense. So. And with that uh, flexibility, we wanted to be able to provide um, course materials for students to have this be as accessible as possible. Um, Being Human was selected as the one book, one San Diego um, down here. Um, so we were able to obtain uh, additional copies, hard copies that we were able to distribute to our students. And then with taking the two courses, we also offered um, Kurzweil licenses. Um, so Kurzweil is a program that reads uh, text on the computer screen, and there's also a writing feature associated with it. So all students um, were able to get a Kurzweil license and have the electronic file of being human um, be put in their Kurzweil so they could access the book, both with the physical hard copy as well as an electronic copy. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. Um, and so how it works, so our course scheduling, we have um, on Mondays and Wednesdays, I teach a Zoom course, synchronous course. So having it in multiple modalities also, also has, has improved accessibility. Um, but then also, and then DSPS 43 is taught on campus by Dr. Nichols and um, it's taught in the high tech center. And so students are able to take advantage of that resource and learn about that resource. And so, um, yeah, and take ownership of that and be able to like, experience that for themselves. Um, and then we've collaborated with different departments. We have the English department. We also have the English Center, which is our writing center at San Diego City College. We have the DSPS department, and we also have an um, embedded SI2 supplemental instructor, instruction tutor to help along with um, individual needs, student needs. Um, and it really allows us to be flexible in the moment um, and being able to meet students where they are. Mm -hmm. And with meeting students where we are, this also translates to um, kind of how we're looking at the lessons that we're teaching. Um, so gauging, okay, are students getting the lesson this week? Do we need to spend more time on this? 
Um, and Professor Grimshaw and I meet every week, um, either for half hour or an hour, depending upon kind of what's going on that particular uh, week. And we brainstorm, okay, what's gonna be the next lesson? Um, how can we align our lessons together? If there's students who are maybe struggling in one particular course, what can we do to be intentional to reach out to the student and provide support to them, um, as well as share like successes um, with each other as well. So it's been really helpful to be able to retain um, and keep those students engaged in both of our courses. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. And so some sample assignments that we have. So our, our our first essay in English 101X was summarizing, quoting, and responding. And we were summarizing and quoting and responding um, a film called The Crip Camp, which is going back to this idea of disability culture and disability perspective and um, and thinking about that. Um, and so students practice summarizing that and quoting from that and responding to it. Um, and we um, hosted a, a optional movie night to build community and build camaraderie between students. And so we were able to see um, more student engagement that way. Um, yeah. And then also, yeah, sorry. And then also <laughs> mandatory individual conferences for English 101X. We have students meet with myself or with, um, with our embedded tutor. And then to also support the essay writing, um, all students were trained on the writing portion of Kurzweil. So being able to create a brainstorm that will seamlessly transfer to an outline. And then students can also write the drafts of their essays with the outline in front of them. And a lot of students are doing um, this work in our high tech center, um, gaining attendance hours and using the resources and staff that we have in our high tech center to support them, not only with maybe retraining, relooking at Kurzweil, but looking at other softwares as well. Um, in addition to working on assignments for Professor Grimshaw's class, as well as others. Um, we're hopeful to have a, um, a Q&A with uh, Judy Human this semester, but it was rescheduled. So that was an exciting thing we we're hoping to have um, mm -hmm. with our students as well. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. And so um, what we've noticed so far, because we're in the first semester, so we're the pilot program for this, um, and uh, some obstacles that we've seen are like at the beginning, we didn't really foresee um, prep work um, entailing so much time, but with ad codes and scheduling and making sure that students were where they needed to be um, in regards to both of our classes. Um, and then a success, I'm not just going to go over the obstacles because I feel like, yeah, it's great to go over both, um, a sense of belonging and representation for students. And so um, I've had multiple students come and say that they're excited to see that there's a representation of themselves within the film, but also within the book that we're reading. Mm -hmm. Another obstacle we've experienced was the misconception about kind of the target population for the courses, um, especially with the English course, like it, these courses are open to anyone um, and having that stigma surrounding disability by both colleagues um, who are recommending students for the course, um, as well as themselves, students themselves, um, and making sure that this course is appropriate for the person who wants to be there um, versus um, wanting to be in, a, let's say, another English class um, and choosing to remain there versus being referred to our course. Um, another success that we've had was increased collaboration across the departments. Um, so because students are accessing the high tech center, um, the English tutoring center, meeting with both Professor Grimshaw and myself, um, it's been really helpful in solving some complex individual student situations um, to be able to support them in the best way possible for them. Mm -hmm. um, and then navigating, I guess one another obstacle would be navigating multiple disability types and symptoms in class and making sure that we're meeting students' individual needs and, uh, and uh, I'm supporting them the best way that we can. Um, and then a success would be student engagement. Students have been, attendance is up and students are excited to be in class and participate and learn alongside um, everyone that's there, but also seeing that representation and also learning about disability has been an exciting um, venture for all of us. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. And we want to say thank you for allowing us to be here. And if you have any, have any questions, put them in the Q&A. Um, and you can reach me at uh, tfnickel at sdccd.edu if you have any further questions. Perfect. And you can also reach me at tgrimshaw at sdccd.edu. And then I'm at uh, multiple other colleges, but you can learn more about me if you email me. So have a great, thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Taylor and Tuckle, for sharing that. It's very interesting to see how you approach, you know, the needs of your students with disabilities at your college. And it's great to see that you had that support to, you know, dive into this and create something like is showing that it can be very helpful for students. So mm -hmm. um, thank you for sharing that information with us. Um, so up next, we have De Anza College here um, sharing what, what they're be doing with, for their DSPS students. Hi, everyone. My name is Kathy Patel. Um, I am representing De Anza College. And I think, Daisy, my, my uh, thing's not working to move the slides. So can you move the slide over for me, please? Try it now if you can. Okay. Nope, it's not letting okay. me move. Now I'll do okay, it sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we offer a plethora of classes. We have our LS50 class, which is a student success strategies class. And the topics that are covered are here, test taking strategy, taking better notes, organizing your time. And these are open to all students, but primarily we recommend it to our DSPS um, students um, at De Anza. Can next slide. We also offer LS 209, which is the basic arithmetic skills and strategies. We go over the fundamental basics. I'm going to get into um, get into it a little bit more. I just want to show you the classes that we offer um, fractions, measurements um, and all that good stuff for basic skills. Next slide, please. We offer LS211, which is one of our most popular classes, and that's algebra skills. Um, they do pre-algebra and statistics. Due to AB705, we've kind of morphed it into a little bit more to collaborate with our um, math department, and I'll get into that a little bit more as well. Next slide. And then we offer the LS207, which is the introductory to writing and grammar skills. This class, Although it's not a co-requisite, we've worked with our English department collaboratively so that most of our students in the DSPS take this class along with our English 1A class. Um, the reason being is we've worked really hard. It's a lot of work um, to collaborate with our English professors. And luckily, um, we've been able to pick a couple out that work with us and give us their curriculum so our students get a double dose of the english curriculum at the same time so most of the time we are in constant communication with english 1a um, and they usually text me and tell me so and so if they have a student in their class having some issues they let us know they give us the work and I work on the assignment with them. And then on top of that, I send them to the DSPS one-on-one -on -one individual tutoring. Um, so they get that support as well for English. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we use these courses? Students um, who are placed in Math 10 or Math 44 will be asked to take LS211. And in LS211, the instructor, me, will work with the current math professor to teach the student the math curriculum. It's a maximum of 15, but because of AB705, I've actually had a little bit over 30, 35 students um, in each of the classes because we've had a lot of success. Students placed in English 1A will be asked to take LS207. Again, it's not a co-requisite. So at the beginning, our class numbers were a little bit low, but as we've shown success, the class numbers are actually a little overwhelming <laughs> at this time. So the class will be given the exact same curriculum that the English 1A professor is teaching and students will get the lesson twice and they will be required to go to tutoring. Sometimes um, before COVID, we actually had one of our tutors come into class to assist as well. After COVID, because of our students having the online hybrid and all those choices, we're working on that. Um, students who are not quite ready to enter transfer level classes will be placed in LS50 and LS209. But um, usually we'll encourage them to take the transfer level classes after they've taken that class. And the purpose of LS50 is it is open to everybody, but for our DSPS students, um, the purpose of that is so that we can accept, assess their abilities a little bit closer and then work with them on their needs. So to improve their skills, to get wraparound services like tutoring, um, and to learn how to communicate better with the professor in regards to their needs. Next slide, please. Okay, so for our support, it is um, 
quite a bit of work. We work with each individual village. We work with MPS, EOPS, Puente, Umoja, and then the AAP, um, the Asian community as well. We actually have really, really good communication and we do weekly check-ins. So for example, just this week with Umoja, we had a weekly check-in with all the students that we had in common and we are easily accessible. So the DSPS counselors um, are accessible and we work with their accommodations to make sure that they have the right technology, note-taking skills, um, and anything like that that they need to ensure that A, they're requesting their accommodation and know how to request their accommodations, but also if we need to adjust them, we do individualize our um, accom um, accommodation and intake process to, make, to ensure that each accommodation is ensures success for our students. We have one-on-one -on -one specialized um, tutoring for each department. And what's nice about our tutoring is that we work with them as well to show them what the teachers, the professors are expecting. So for example, in Math 44, there's a big project at the end. Um, our two, all of our tutors are familiar with that project and know what the professor expects in order to complete that project and su successfully pass the class. So again, we work with tutors and instructors um, and professors to get feedback, and we assist the faculty with syllabus design and evaluation to keep um, equity and universal design in mind. We're huge on UDL, um, and we work with each individual professor if they need it. They text us, they ask us tons of questions, especially with the extension on assignments, um, so that they know that we're working individually with each of the students. Next slide. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Kathy, for sharing that. It's really great that you have that kind of collaboration with all those different villages, as you call them. I like that word. Um, and really being there and being, um, you know, accessible, as you said, for the students to get these needs. And, and uh, good to see that you have something for your both English and your math department, you know, because both of those uh, subjects have been shown to be important for students, you know, success outcomes. Um, so I believe that that is it from our panelists and it from our, uh, you know, the data aspect of this. So Mallory, I don't know if there are any um, questions in the chat or in the Q&A that maybe are, you know, for our panelists here that could answer. Yeah, so we've been trying to answer the questions as we go. Um, there is... Um, there's uh, was quite a few questions. Um, I guess there's a question for you, Kathy, of how many units are the LS classes? There are four units each. Great, thank you. Um, and then there's a question around if a student has different primary disabilities within a term at different colleges, are those placed in the other in the report? So it's the way that we have collected the disability type is however the college is reporting it to MIS, to the chancellor's office, um, as their primary disability. And that's what we are, we're um, pulling in there. And then I don't know if um, Mia at the chancellor's office, if you know if there's any data around how many colleges are using universal design instruction for transfer level English and math, that is not a, a number that I know of. Yeah, I do not, I don't believe we have data on that, but something that might be of interest is we are going to begin this year a universal design task force that will be coming up with recommendations for all colleges. And then next year, we hope to um, be working on implementing those recommendations. And we have also made an ask in the 23-24 um, state budget for additional um, $20 million to support universal design for our courses. So more to come on that. Any other um, additional comments from our um, panelists that you wanted to add to any of your presentations? Great, okay, and then any additional questions from the audience? So we will post this um, webinar on um, the Multiple Measures Assessment Project um, page, which is also in the Q&A, if you want to grab that link before you head out. 
Um, but we did, you know, want to thank you for attending today. I hope that this information was helpful. Um, a big thanks to all of our panelists from Orange Coast College, San Diego City College, and De Anza College to sharing their promising practices. You guys did fantastic in sticking to your time frame. We did not go over, which was great. Um, and to Daisy um, Segovia for um, the work that she's done around this research brief um, for our DSPS um, community. And then also, if you want to learn more um, around disaggregated data with other, um, other groups, I did link to the uh, Chancellor's Office Transfer Level Gateway Completion Dashboard. And you can look at these different rates um, for different groups uh, disaggregated um, and by college and region. So it's another resource that's linked in the chat as well. We have some um, great webinars and thank yous coming in. Very helpful. I don't see any new questions coming in. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.